everyone. Thank you for staying, staying behind before the party tonight. Um, it's great to see you all here. Um, I know there's a, there's a bit of an issue with the timings, and I think people are still trying to get a coffee before we get going again, but we want to keep to time so that we can all get ready for the party. Uh, my name's Dorothy Newbury Birch, and I am Professor of Alcohol and Public Health Research, and I'm also the Director of the Centre for Crime, Harm Prevention and Security at Teesside University. And myself and my team are going to talk you through some of the work that we're doing around alcohol and drugs within the criminal justice system back home in the UK. So, what we know is that in England, we do have high prevalence of alcohol consumption just in the general population. But contrary to popular beliefs, we're not the top of the league table in relation to this, but we are sort of halfway through and we are worse than Sweden. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's quite right to say that we do have a major issue with um, levels of risky drinking and levels of alcohol dependence in the UK. So we know that in the UK that um, alcohol misuse costs us around £21 billion per year. Um, with healthcare 3.5 billion, crime 11 billion, and lost productivity, that is mostly due to um, workplace absences, uh, 7.3 billion. And these, um, these numbers were done probably a decade ago, so we can probably add at least 20% onto that. But we also know from research done in the UK that um, that for every one pound we invest in specialist alcohol treatment, five pound is saved on health, welfare and crime costs. Now this is really important in these days of austerity where public health cuts, where our money comes from alcohol, whether it's in the criminal, alcohol interventions, whether it's in the criminal justice system or within the health system are being cut back time and time again. There was a TV programme on um, last night, and I caught this on Twitter this morning, that said that if everyone in the UK drank within recommended limits, the alcohol industry would lose £10 billion annually. So there is no reason for them to do more than voluntary uh, work towards um, reducing alcohol consumption. So how many people are drinking too much in the UK? Well, it's around about 20 to 30% of risky drinkers. These are people who go into primary care and um, are going to see their GP um, and are classed as um, drinking too much. We also know that about 4% of people are dependent on alcohol, so they're drinking enough for it to have be really detrimental to themselves. In certain parts of England, this is higher, such as the northeast, where we're from, and the northwest, and it's lower in some areas like London and other areas. So there's real regional differences. Um, we know that a lot of people are in treatment for their problematic drinking, um, drinking and there's a, an increase year on year, but we've seen a decrease in the last year in people going into treatment, and probably this is because of the cut in services and there not being services there for people to access. So how do we know if someone has an alcohol use disorder? How do we know if we're drinking at risky levels? And if I did this with a room full of 100 people, round in the UK, around about 30 to 40 people would be classified as having um, an alcohol use disorder, and most of them would not realise. So this is us. It's not those people that drink too much. And the way to do it is to use a validated screening tool. And there are a number on the market, shall we say, but the gold standard is the 10 question audit. So if you want to know if somebody has an alcohol use disorder, then the 10 question audit is the best tool to use in order to find this out. This is the three question audit. And 
If you just have a look at this and look to see what you would score, as you can see it's zero, one, two, three, four, and you add up for each row, if you're scoring five or more, that means that you are at risk of um, drinking too much and that you should have a discussion with somebody, your GP, around that. Most people will just be over over the limit of that and some very simple steps to reduce their drinking can be really effective. So what about in the criminal justice system? Well, my team at, at um, Teesside have carried out loads of work in the UK about alcohol consumption in the criminal justice system. Pretty sure we've carried out more research in this area than any other institution in the UK. So what we know is that in police custody suites, round about 65 to 84% of people are drinking too much. Remember, we said 30% in general population. Probable dependency is between 21 and 38%. These are cross-sectional studies that are giving us this information, compared to 4% in the uh, general population. In probation, we found that it's between 59 and 67 percent of people who are um, who are drinking too much, compared to uh, 30 percent in general population, and dependency is between 17 and 33 percent. In prisons, we find that between half and 83 percent of people are drinking too much, and dependency ranges from 25 to 43 percent. Now, that means we've got a real issue around prevalence rates within this group of individuals, this population of people. So therefore, interventions may be different, differently needed because of that. Now, I put this slide up because I wanted you to see young people as well, because I'm often asked about young people. What we found from a, a very small colloquial study we did a few years ago is that when we use adult cutoffs for uh, risky drinking, round about um, two thirds of young people between 11 and 17 are drinking too much with 30% dependent. Now that's using adult cutoffs and we shouldn't be using adult cutoffs. If we use young people's cutoffs as um, as shown by night in 2003, 81% of them would score as um, drinking too much, with three quarters of them being dependent on alcohol. So therefore, we have a huge issue within the criminal justice system. So what can we do? I feel like I've been working on this, well, I have been working on it for 20 years, and I do feel like this man. Um, and I think, um, We've got tons of evidence that tell us that brief interventions work in, um, in the general population, mostly with GP practices. And my work and my team's work is primarily around looking to see can we develop those interventions with, and will they work within the criminal justice system? So what I mean by brief, brief interventions is there are, there, it's called different things and there are slight variations on this, but basically there's two kinds. There's five to ten minutes of brief advice where myself as the person talking to the patient would do most of the talking. I'm giving advice, I'm giving... Um, you know, what, what the general population um, do and also what what are the benefits of cutting down and getting people to think about, you know, what would be, what would be some of the things I could do. If I wanted to do something a little bit more in depth, we could do an extended brief intervention and this is using motivational interviewing um, techniques. And this is about the person coming up with ideas and a plan to how they can make change, and also looking to see where their readiness to change is in terms of, of the cycle to see whether or not they're ready to make changes at this point in their life. So we did a systematic review a couple of years ago and we looked for all sorts of brief interventions across the world for, um, for brief interventions. We included randomised control trials or, um, or those that, that used some kind of control group. And we found very little. Um, 
we found that in police custody suites, when we were looking at this, there was no statistically significant differences um, in two studies in the police custody suites. There were small studies, they were done a while ago now, and they were a matched control design. So not only methodologically were they not as good as they could be, um, they're too small scale for us to make any inference from that. Now for probation, it's really interesting because there was a study by Aure et al in 2015 who, um, who did a randomised trial of, of brief interventions, but they only followed up 22% of people. They sent, they sent a questionnaire out to them. So the results, they didn't get many back, so the results weren't able to be interpreted in any way. But a study um, that I led on um, as part of the SIPS programme of work showed no difference in, um, in drinking levels between the control group and the intervention group, but it did show a difference in reoffending. so much so that if, um, if you had a brief intervention, you were less likely to reoffend the year after. So it's not enough in itself, but it's some promising work to show that perhaps we don't need to look at it as a health issue or a criminal justice issue, but it's both. So in prison, again, there was no studies in prison, um, no efficacy or effectiveness studies. <clears throat> and once again, we couldn't find any, um, any real evidence within the begun trial, but in the Stown trial, uh, in the Stein trial, we found that, um, that those randomised to a brief intervention had significantly few drink drinking days of, at three months, but this was not maintained at six months. And part of us thinks, well, why would it be? There, needs, there, there may need to be a follow-up for people within the criminal justice system that you don't necessarily need in primary care because people are drinking more. Um, and in the Davis study, um, we found that they were more likely to, we, I didn't, they found that they were more likely to schedule appointments for follow-up um, sessions within, um, within the clinics um, following the intervention. Now, part of the problem we have with brief intervention studies, part of the problem we have with any experimental criminology studies is that we're all using different outcomes. So we can't compare them. We can't, when we do random, when we do systematic reviews, we can't pull the data together because we're using different time frames and we're using different um, outcome measures. And I've been in um, involved in a European group where we're looking to develop a core outcome set for brief interventions with the idea that we will also do one for criminal justice brief intervention studies. So it's really important that we think about this. I come from a public health background. I started as a criminologist. I worked on the restorative justice trials with Larry Sherman and Heather Strang. And then I very much became public health, and I'm still public health and will remain public health because I think public health encompasses criminal justice, um, and I think we should really remember that. And I think for me, it could be argued that the stages in the CGS are analogous to the healthcare system. Police custody suites are busy and chaotic, very much like accident and emergency departments. So, you know, if you're doing research in here, you're in, you're out, you don't know who's going to be there, you know, wherever you are. Probation is similar to primary care, appointments are made, and an emphasis on dealing with the underlying issues if they turn up for their appointment, which we had a huge problem with. Prison is similar to hospital wards in as much as often the person is there for a period of time. So if you want to do research in the criminal justice system around alcohol, prison seems the best bet. But how do you measure outcomes if people are in prison? They're all successful, yay. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have to find ways around that, and we are. So alcohol use levels are high in the criminal justice system. There's a clear evidence of ABIs in the health system, but a lack of evidence so far on ABIs, alcohol brief interventions, in the criminal justice system. And we need more, well, we need more research. Most of my money for research comes from the health sector, public health, NIHR. And we are running two 
massive studies at the minute, one with young offenders and one with remand male prisoners. So our primary outcome of interest is reduced alcohol consumption. But in terms of those of us that are criminologists, it means that our secondary outcomes can be related to crime, which has been really useful to us and actually really important that we look at these two things hand in hand. So that's, that's my presentation, and I'm going to introduce people one by one as they come up um, to, talk you through, um, to talk you through their work. I'm really pleased that we've got, um, we've got a mix of people um, talking to you today. So we've got two PhD students, one in our third year and one in our second year. Um, we've got um, a researcher who's just finished her PhD who's looking at co-production. So, She'll explain to you what that is. So next up is Jennifer Ferguson, who is a third year PhD student, and she's going to talk us through her exciting work uh, with women in the uh, prison system. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about my PhD, which is up there. So it's a mixed method study. Um, what I feel like I should start with saying is I've worked very closely with Dot and her team, so although this is my PhD, um, I have quite a lot of experience, um, not only around a ABI, which I'm going to talk about, um, but in the prison setting, and actually the, the big project she was talking about before, about the male remand prisoners, is actually what I started this research on and kind of sat and thought, you know, I'm sitting in prison, I'm collecting this data from men, but actually, why are we not kind of doing this with women? And so I will talk you through a little bit about what my PhD is, um, why I'm doing it, what I intend to do. I am in my third year, but I've still got a long way to go. Um, and unfortunately, although I can't give some really exciting results today, I thought I might talk you through my systematic review because I kind of want to give something. So um, let's see. So the aim of the PhD overall was to see how feasible it is to carry out brief alcohol interventions with women in prison. So as I say, we're currently doing this with men, but I want, what I want to see from this is, can we do this with women? We know it's a whole different issue, um, and I'll talk through some of those with you in a minute. Um, so I had a few different objectives for this. So I know Dot's mentioned systematic reviews, and I know Lynn's going to talk about one. Um, Natalie probably will, because we absolutely love doing them. So for this PhD, um, I set out to do two different systematic reviews, and I'll talk you through them in a moment. Um, and there's obviously some data collection in the prison, so there'll be some qualitative interviews with women. Um, so women who are in a prison, but also with the staff in the prison, because what I want to know, and I'm really glad that Dot talked you through what an ABI is, so I don't have to do that, um, is what, so we've got this well-evidenced intervention, but what can we do to make this more suited to women? So um, when should it be done in the prison setting? Um, who should do it, um, all those kind of things. And also from the point of view of the staff, because I could come up with this amazing, lovely intervention, and then the staff could just go, well, <laughs> that's not going to work. So there's a few different elements to this. And what I'm really keen to do is, once I've kind of fine-tuned the intervention, take it back to the women, because the idea is I will go on to do a pilot study of my beautiful intervention, but what I want to do is make sure what I've decided from this data collection is, is this what the women meant? Because that would just be horrendous if it wasn't. So to give a bit of background, why, prison, uh, why women in prison, um, Dot's just talked us through the high prevalence rates, and I thought I would just break them down into um, male and female. So not that it makes much of a difference, but just to kind of give some perspective. So. In the general population, what we know is around about 30% of, of, of us, of people, um, have a potential alcohol use disorder. What Dot told us before is in prison, that's huge. It's, it's much higher. And actually, for women, it's around about 63%. So more than half of the women in there are going to kind of benefit from this well-evidenced intervention. So around about 13,500 women every year go into, the, um, into prison in the UK. What's important is women in prison in the UK only make up about 5% of the overall population, which when we, 
come on to look at um, issues for women in prison really stands out. And if you look at the one at the bottom, a um, little bit old now, but um, a quarter of all self-harm incidents um, in prison, and that's male and female, are, due, are down to women. And when you think, well, they're only making up 5% of the population, that's really, really massive. There's something going on with this population, and we can't just kind of say, you know, well, we'll make this, we'll tailor this intervention to people in prison and kind of ignore the fact that they have these significant issues. So aside from that, there's other things. So obviously children. So 60% of women, um, again, this is quite old. <laughs> I did start my PhD a long time ago. Um, so more than half of the women in prison ha have got children who are dependent on them. So there's obviously significant issues coming from that. Um, and that at the time, there was around about 17,000 children being separated from the mums, which, of course, has an effect on the children, but as well has an effect on that woman in prison. Abuse, so sexual abuse, physical abuse, any kind of abuse um, is, is much higher in women. So nearly twice as many women who are in prison will have suffered some sort of abuse um, as a child. There's, there's obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a lot more issues in this, but I kind of wanted to just highlight, you know, why I want to tailor this intervention to women. Because although they're only 5% of the population, it of course makes sense to, to focus on, a, on the majority of prisoners and kind of do this intervention that's going to fit everybody. But actually, because 63% of them have a potential alcohol use disorder, I really want to kind of just see, can we do, th can we do this? <clears throat> We also need to think, you know, men are different from women. We have different genetics. We have issues like pregnancy, um, menopause, some of the women in prison. Um, things as simple as we have different um, masses of water in our bodies. So all these things I've kind of thought, you know, right, we want to, I want to tailor this intervention. So like I said, there was a few different objectives to kind of develop this intervention. Um, so I didn't set out to do this, but this is <laughs> what I'm now doing. So I've got two systematic reviews. Um, then I'll go on to do the qualitative interviews, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Kind of triangulate all those results to form a, a really small pilot. And if anybody works with the NIHR, I do not mean I'm going to pilot this intervention. I simply mean whatever I find I'm going to take back into the prison. Um, to kind of, the overall aim is to make recommendations for, for a future study and take this work forward. So anybody who has worked in prison um, in the UK, it, I, I promise it didn't used to be this hard, but it's now um, governed by HMPPS as opposed to NOMS, if anybody knows anything about it. And for some reason, ethical approval has just been a headache. It's hard enough trying to get into a male prison, but everybody I speak to just, you want to go into work with women, and it's just, as it should be, very difficult, but a lot more difficult than I thought, hence why um, I still can't share any data with you from the prison, but I'm getting there. <laughs> so what I did want to talk you through um, is something that I do have kind of some information about, and tell you a little bit about the two systematic reviews and why I wanted to do them. So. The first one that I did, um, the barriers and facilitators of the use of ABI, so I don't need to talk you through that, thank God, um, for, wi for women. And this wasn't women in prison because nobody's done any work around this, so it was just simply women. And the reason I wanted to do this was because I could kind of gather the data from this and use it to kind of go into the prison and say, right, it's a, it appears that women in general have these issues. Of course, they're going to have extra issues, but it kind of was going to give me a starting point. And this is the one I'm going to talk you through today. But I also, more recently, <laughs> decided I really like doing systematic reviews, so I'll do another one. Um, and what I wanted to look at was um, the gendered pains of imprisonment. And what I mean by that is things, like I just said before, so mental health issues, um, how, they, how they feel and how they deal with having their children taken away from them. Or what I've learned more recently, a huge thing, is trust and lack of trust in staff and actually anybody. Um, and I thought, right, I need to know all these things, so I might as well do a systematic review. But actually more technical than that, it means because my PhD is obviously looking at a brief alcohol intervention, it's very public health, and it actually started as pure public health. 
but it's a criminology PhD. I'm going into prison. I'm thinking about what these women are feeling and how this intervention is going to fit in this setting. And I've struggled with that because I'm, I'm kind of sat in the middle. So the idea of having the two systematic reviews and pulling them together is, is, the, is the way that I'm going. So I'll talk you through the first one. So what I decided for this systematic review was whatever I find from, from this, I can use to develop my um, interview schedules when I go and talk to the women. So what I included in, in this systematic review was anyone who was over 18. And remember, we're not talking about prison. We're just looking at women. Um, any qualitative studies, so interviews, focus groups, ethnography, but also um, any quantitative studies if they'd used a survey. I don't think there was any, but it was in there. Um, only ABI, which was face-to-face, -face, because I know Dot talked you through the, the brief alcohol intervention before, but there is kind of a trend to move towards more online, more group, um, but actually, we just, I just decided I was going to look at face-to-face -face interventions. Any language? Um, brief interventions, <sighs> some people will do studies and some will be 10 minutes, and it's usually about 10 to 40 minutes. Um, but some studies you read and they've included, they're, they're like six weeks long. So I decided it couldn't be more than four sessions and it had to last um, less than 40 minutes. And the reason for that was because that's kind of the intervention that I would want to be developing for these women in prison because they don't, we don't have millions of hours for them. <clears throat> I decided I would look at um, accounts from both women who were receiving um, brief alcohol interventions and people who were delivering these type of interventions to, um, to women, and simply because that's kind of the same approach of my as my PhD. You can't just kind of look at, well, how are these women finding it? You've got to kind of think, well, it's got to be feasible, so it's also, you've also got to think about the people delivering it, and actually what kind of issues come that they're facing as well. Um, so the exclusion was pretty much just the opposite. Um, and I did exclude any studies prior to 1980, and that was just simply to do with um, the evidence of brief interventions coming into place around about then. So what did I find then? Well, I had, it was quite a small systematic review, so I don't know if people are familiar with systematic reviews, but the, this was, um, I think, this, if you can read that, it was about 8,000 studies included. Um, and to put that into perspective, my other one, that I'm doing around um, gendered pains is about 19,000. So this one was a breeze. Um, and I ended up with six papers in the review, two from the UK, two from Finland, and two from the USA, which actually, on hindsight, the, the data from the USA was, was, was quite different because obviously they don't have the NHS. Everything was to do with cost, basically, and we'll come up, I'll come on to that in a minute. They were all qualitative papers, and I got what I wanted. I got different perspectives. I got people delivering it. So there was GPs, um, there was sexual health clinics, um, and so I got the range of the practitioners, and then I got the views from the women as well. So I'm not going to go into it in, in great detail, but I am going to give you a quick overview of some of the barriers um, and some of the facilitators that were found in this review, just to kind of show you, you know, this is just women in the general population that are finding these issues with this intervention. You then couple that with um, women in prison who have major issues around trust or have experienced trauma, um, it, it's, it's going to be um, amplified. So in terms of barriers and in terms of the person who was delivering the brief intervention, the age of the woman came up quite a lot. And so they were saying, you know, the woman in front, um, it made a difference if they were kind of younger women or older women um, equally because it's a sensitive topic, kind of talking about, are you drinking too much? Um, it can be, and especially if it's said like that, which it shouldn't be, um, but it is a sensitive topic. Um, but also what was quite important, and I think we would all be quite guilty of this, um, is they were self-assessing the prevalence of the woman, so they were kind of saying, right, um, Someone's came from work, she's got a really good job, she's came from work, she's come for her appointment, oh, I don't need to ask her about alcohol because she's fine, she's fine, she's been to work all day. And they were kind of making that assumption um, about that woman's drinking without even having a conversation about it. Um, and those of us who work in this field know that that's, <laughs> it's never going to work like that. Um, and 
the, the trust thing came up a lot. Nobody, I think this, this was really interesting because this came up in a study um, that was done in a sexual health clinic. Um, and what was interesting was they were saying, well, I don't want to kind of damage the level of trust that I have with them by saying, you know, oh, well, by the way, about your alcohol, when they're coming to them for maybe the morning after pill or something like that, and it's kind of, if I, if I freak them out now, they're never going to come back, and then there's obviously more consequences from that. So it was, it was really, really interesting. In terms of from the point of view of the woman, um, all the things that we would kind of expect to see, so belittlement, um, what was quite interesting was um, some of the barriers that the women were saying um, around this intervention were, you know, well, if, you, if they then say to me, you need to cut down on your drinking, I'm drinking because I'm dealing with stress or negative emotions. If I can't do that, how do I then deal with those emotions? So it was kind of, you're going to take away the comfort blanket. Um, and actually, what also, another thing that was quite interesting was they were saying, you know, well, I'm not really bothered if my GP wants to talk to me about my drinking because I've seen him down the local pub on Friday and he drinks too much, and there was a lot of that coming through. Facilitators, there wasn't as many, um, which is a shame, but also give me more to talk about when I go into the, women, uh, the prison with the women. Um, but they, it was quite interesting, they were saying, you know, if they had um, a poster on the wall and the, and the staff could say, you know, oh, um, the, have you seen this poster from the university and kind of put the, the pressure onto the university and say, they want me to talk to you about your drinking as opposed to, oh, I think I need to talk to you about your drinking. Um, and, and actually what came up a lot was using posters um, about ABI. You know, the women would make a joke of it and they'd say, you know, oh, that's me. And then that was the way in to say, well, shall we have a little chat about that? Um, from the point of the women th themselves, um, things like, again, trust, um, feeling comfortable with the person, and this got me thinking, you know, when I go to, to develop this intervention, I really need to home in with the women, you know, who, if anybody, do you trust to talk about sensitive things, or who do you feel comfortable with, because I could go in and say, right, I think a drug and alcohol worker in the prison should do this, or... I mean, you would never, but a prison officer, or I could make an assumption, but if that woman doesn't feel, com if the women in that prison don't feel comfortable, it's never going to work, they're never going to open up. Um, and what came up a lot was having a range of people, so offering an alternative or a choice, maybe. So that was kind of what I found in that systematic review. The, the other one, as I said, talks about the, the specific pains that women feel around um, being imprisoned, and that will obviously be unpicked further in the qualitative data. So the next steps of the PhD are, are, are being in the prison um, and collecting the data, which, as I say, mirrors what we're already doing with the males, and speaking to them around um, who should, develop, who should um, deliver this intervention, but also what, what, which bits of the intervention are kind of speaking to the women. So showing them the intervention that Dot showed you before and saying, you know, which elements of this. We did this with the males um, in a study called Prisma. And what they were saying, and I did the data collection for that, and what they kind of kept saying in that was this bit about what are the risky situations. So when is it that you feel like you need or, or more likely to have a drink or... Um, and, and the goal set an element of the ABI. So it will be really interesting to see, you know, is that the same with the women or, or is it a different element of the, the intervention? Um, but at the moment, obviously, I don't have that data due to problems with ethical approval, um, but that's kind of where the PhD's at. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. I should have said we'll take questions at the end, if that's all right, because they do these presentations do sort of link together, so you might actually get the answer within the next presentation to the question. So next up, we've got um, Lynn Dugan, who is um, a second-year PhD student, full-time PhD student, who's going to um, talk us through if I can find it, talk us through um, where she is with her PhD research. 
What's interesting about, well, there's a lot of things interesting about Lynn, but um, Lynn is a practitioner who's worked in drug and alcohol services and commissioning, so she's, she's teaching us as much as uh, we're teaching her in this PhD. So she's going to tell you what she's doing and um, some of our interesting findings so far. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Not a lot. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, as Dot says, um, I'm what you call a pragmatic practitioner, <laughs> um, and I'm a second year PhD student. Um, I just want to sort of kind of put that in context by just saying about my kind of pr pragmatic approach. Um, my background's in a range of backgrounds, but predominantly around sort of health and social care. Um, I've had some uh, time working in prisons. Um, I've worked with a range of different people from different um, experiences, so people with mental health, people with um, learning disabilities, vulnerable adults, uh, so a whole, a whole range of people, which has sort of informed my choice of PhD subject, really. Um, and really important for me that it was something that really um, fitted in with my current practice, but also fitted in with my um, level of understanding and stretched my level of understanding. So my topic was really chosen around um, something that really sparked my imagination because of my experience working particularly in health and criminal justice. Um, so my topic is a systematic review of the published worldwide evidence relating to the complex needs of adults, 18 plus, within the medium and low secure hospital setting. Bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, but in essence, what it is about is, um, sorry, I don't know what I've done to this, but hey, let me just. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, that's better. So, um, so my question for my PhD is, to what extent can we explore the evidence relating to trauma? Now, trauma for me is a really important aspect because throughout my career, I've worked with people that have experienced trauma, either trauma from an early childhood or trauma from a significant event that's happened in their life. And that's played out into their um, future and how they come into services and how they come into contact with services. So trauma is quite an important part of sort of the work that I do. Um, but I wanted to look specifically, um, the team that I work in looks specifically around alcohol and substances. Um, so I wanted to look at that kind of, the, the, the interrelationship and the correlation between trauma and alcohol and drugs but also sort of broadening that out a little bit and looking at mental health and also looking at substances, uh, sorry, looking at uh, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. Again, because of my experience, I've come across quite a lot of people that, that in my experience you would have said, um, you know, when you talk to them, they talk about their mother's uh, risky drinking and all those sorts of things, mother drinking as, as the, uh, when they were pregnant, etc. So for me, um, pulling all those themes together was a really important aspect. So the topics were trauma, complex needs, mental health, substance misuse, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and just to be specific, trauma is a significant event. So I'm just looking at one significant event or P uh, PTSD or any, anything that comes under that, something that's affected and defined somebody's life. Um, in terms of mental health, I'm looking at people um, under the Mental Health Act 1983, so specifically looking at people that are incarcerated because of their mental health. Um, and for substance misuse, I'm looking at dependent drinking and uh, dependent substance misuse. And fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome, I'm looking at specifically about people that have had um, an experience from their, mother drink, uh, their mother's drinking as, uh, within pregnancy. Um, the setting of my, my sort of research was quite important for me again because um, throughout this, this um, symposium we've heard about quite a lot of sort of research and evidence around criminal justice but lots and lots around prisons but not so much around a secure hospital setting. Um, so I wanted to sort of specifically con concentrate on that clinical setting for my, my sort of research really and my um, systematic review. Um, my methodology used was a mixed method, um, systematic review. For those of you that are familiar with systematic reviews, um, there's very, various ways to do. But for me, um, it's, it's a healthcare setting, so I wanted to do a systematic review. Um, the clinical evidence, the evidence base tells us that that's the best way to sort of ensure that we get the right decisions for individuals and patients so, and sort of affect public health policies. So for me, that was important to make sure that we did that. Um, in terms of the objectives, um, there were three main objectives. The first one was to identify and establish the extent of previously conducted research 
around the correlation of those topics um, within that low secure setting. The second one was to explore the kind of organisational and contextual factors around the correlation of trauma and other complexities um, and how this affects interventions. And that was an important one because um, at the end, I'll tell you about my PhD, but it was important to gather some evidence around, is this something that, that I can affect the future delivery of treatment and, and interventions? So I needed to think about that at the very first base. So that was an important objective for me. And then the next one was to inform my next stage of my PhD. I wanted to do something in a systematic review that actually would make a difference to my research when I go in to do my, my uh, PhD research. So it was important to get that connectivity really. Um, in terms of my searches, um, for those of you that have done systematic reviews, um, Jen talked about two there, um, one with sort of seven, 8,000 um, searches, some with 19,000. My um, research was actually um, 18,761 uh, papers that were researched and, and um, searched through. Um, just for those of you that are familiar with the systematic review process, I used PCOS and um, my terms and my selection was really important to me again, I, to make sure that I gathered the right, the right data, the right literature affecting that, that field. So I took great pains about how to um, put the right keywords in to make sure they connect, connected to what I wanted to do, um, not to miss anything, hence why I got 18,000 uh, documents, but also to make sure that um, I was trying to gather all the kind of evidence around, all the literature around what, what, what was out there. So, um, so I took a lot of pain to sort of kind of deliver and des design that. Um, and I did, a, I did a first base run on that to, just to make sure that um, what I was doing was right. And the papers that I got on that first search selection, I used as my, my yardstick to, to inform the next stage. Um, I used Prisma, which is a, identified papers from a database section. Um, and I scanned the 18,761 documents and my results were six papers. So um, of those six papers, um, there was three from the UK, two from the USA and one from Switzerland. Um, and there was lots, what I did find was in my search strategy, there was lots and lots of papers around prison and there was lots of papers correlating the evidence, but there was very limited um, literature around that secure setting and the hospital base. Um, so that's, that's kind of honed into that sort of process, really. Um, what else could I say about it? Um, it was painful. <laughs> um, it took quite a long time. Um, I think the distressing thing around having 18,000 plus papers and coming out with six at the end, and, and Jen uh, related to that as well in terms of her search. Um, but that's how you do a systematic review, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it was the evidence that we, the literature that we gathered. Okay. Um, I'll just jump to the findings, really. Um, there was a few findings, but I think the, the thing for me, I guess it's of, you know, clearly with six papers, you're not going to get a lot of sort of literature evidence, really. So what I would say, my word would be inconclusive. <laughs> um, inconclusive in a lot of ways, in terms of, did it tell me about the correlation and the connectivity between um, trauma and complexity? Um, no, it didn't. Um, did it tell me about what um, the, um, the setting um, and whether there was a clear indication that, um, that there was a, a, a connection? No, it didn't. Um, lots of the stuff that I, I sort of kind of tried to sort of look at in the, before I kind of looked at this as a literature review, really, in a systematic literature review, was to um, talk to some practitioners, and lots of practitioners told me there is an absolute definite correlation. So in some ways I was trying to gather that evidence in this literature search, but actually there was no evidence to select that, although um, anecdotally people tell me that there is. But nonetheless, the findings were inconclusive. Um, but there were some key things that did come from it. Um, there were six studies. Each of the studies were very different. Two concentrated on FASD in the secure setting. Um, two concentrated on mental health and trauma um, in the secure setting, in, in that particular secure setting. Um, 
but there, were, there, was, there was very little commonality between the papers, and it was really difficult to, to grasp sort of the, um, trying to conclude some stuff from it. Um, I, I did do a CASP analysis, um, a critical appraisal analysis of the papers, and only two of them out of the six come up with a evidence that there were a moderate quality, the other four were not. So, so it was difficult to get information from th six papers that weren't really that good to start with. Um, but nonetheless, um, the, the, the fact that they were, they were very different and it was difficult um, did actually sort of get me to think about sort of what does that actually tell me. And what it did tell me was that there is limited literature um, that, con that supports the content and that supports that connectivity. It has told me that that's an area of evidence that's really lacking, so therefore it does warrant some further investigation from a PhD. So that was a really positive. Um, most literature confirmed that there was some preconceived ideas around that social construction of those themes. So for ex what I mean by that is um, someone with, has a mental health issue, um, they're in a, a secure hospital setting, um, they're there because they've got a mental health issue, but there was a real kind of preconception that, well, everybody's here because they've got trauma in their life, or everybody's here because. Um, and there was a lot of kind of social constructs around that because, well, if you're from a disadvantaged area and if you're in a secure hospital setting, and if your your mother was a drinker, then obviously you're going to you're going to sort of kind of have these connections. Um, so that was quite interesting. The sort of kind of social constructs. So the papers that I did sort of derive from, there was quite a bit of social construction. Um, lots and lots about stigma, attitude, morality. Um, expectations and there was there was some stuff around particularly for the the group of people the the two um, papers around FASD about um, preconceived ideas that somebody with FASD um, would then become um, an offender in the future so and some of the stuff around that around the propensity to confabulate for example um, so for example if someone was um, had FASD and um, part of their condition their neurological condition affects their ability to tell the truth so therefore they would end up in offending behavior so that, that's an interesting dynamic about people's social construct but also the neurological stuff that goes with that um, possible effects um, what did, what did sort of derive is that um, a diagnosis of a trauma may link to other key themes. So that, that was clear that there, there was evidence in the, the, the six papers um, and in my wider, my wider learning around trauma that there is, less, there is a likelihood that if someone does have traumatic experiences, either as an early childhood or in adult life, that, that, that would predispose them to some criminal behavior and some criminal activity. And I think that's played out in this conference. I've heard a few people talking about that. And then um, that there may be a connection to crime, trauma, and substances. Um, and again, not a lot of evidence was found in my literature um, in my systematic review. However, um, I do know there's lots of evidence out there about connecting those three elements, um, which again sort of gives me that sort of hope that my PhD research will be valuable in the field. Um, that trauma is likely coupled with a diagnosis of mental health and a, a propensity for forensic support. Um, again, lots of anecdotal evidence, but in the literature search, there wasn't that. It wasn't playing out very much around that. There was some mention of it, but that's more about the dynamics, I think, around mental health and the forensic system that we have. Okay, and particularly related to FASD, there is limited evidence which may attribute to limits in diagnosis. What I mean by that is that um, there is very few people, particularly in the um, U UK, that have a diagnosis of FASD. Now that's because there isn't very good tools to diagnose, um, but also in screening, in particularly in this hospital setting, the, the forensic hospital setting, there's not a lot of screening goes on that, co that connects FASD. And that's about um, practitioners not knowing what to ask and not knowing what tool to use and those sorts of things. So, so there, that sort of played out in my literature search, but again, gives me some evidence to sort of then go off and, and sort of kind of connect that to my PhD study. So what next? Um, so all of this has informed my PhD question and future research. So my, my PhD will be called It's All About the Trauma. Um, an exploration of the facilities and bar barriers to positive treatment outcomes, 
and that's created by individuals 18 years and over with a personal experience of complexities and trauma within a medium and low secure setting, hospital setting. Um, I've chosen 18 years and over because um, I wanted specifically to go into a, a particular setting and really analyse that. So I will be going into an Northeast Hospital Secure um, Estate um, and I will be um, working with um, a group of people. I've got access to 158 um, potential patients and I'll be working with them to look at sort of case study analysis, questions, um, sort of trying to sort of kind of break down what is it from a very personalised basis, your experience of complex needs and trauma um, from a very personal basis as an individual, how does that affect you and what could we do different? So what I mean by that is, is there something that we could have done before you got to this stage? Is there a magic bullet for somebody that perhaps when you were 10 years of age, somebody would have said the right thing to you that might have affected you doing what you're doing now? Or isn't there? And I think that's the kind of key for the sort of research going forward. Um, so my next steps, um, I really want to get to a situation of could we have avoided a hospital admission? Um, in a forensic setting, and really what could have done differently. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, that was brilliant. Um, I think it's really good for us to hear PhD students' research and how these are the next leaders of the future who will be standing here in 15 years' time winning the Stockholm Prize uh, for their work. Um, not that I'm jealous. Um, so we've got, um, we've got a, a duo for the final, um, final presentation. This is some work that um, Natalie, Natalie and I have been working on together. And it's something that's very close to our hearts, and it's around co-production of research and how we do this. So how do we engage with practitioners and young people in carrying out alcohol and drug research in the criminal justice system? And this is really close to our hearts, because if we say to a practitioner, um, we want to do this research, the first thing they say to us is, show us the evidence. But the reality is that there are so many cuts within um, services in the UK and worldwide that there isn't the money to be able to pay for evaluations in the way that we perhaps would like to do. We'd like to do randomised controlled trials for everything, but the reality is people don't have the time or the money in order to pay for these. So. Natalie and I have been working for a number of years now with Durham County Council on a series of co-production evaluations which are quite low level, they're not randomised trials, they're mostly around us looking for the evidence in a certain field and then um, looking to see if they're working in practice. So we do a lot of qualitative work and um, some basic evaluation work. We've done about 15 of these for Durham County Council and we've published about eight of them now with another two or three over the rest of this year. So what it means is we're getting these things published so other areas in England and the world can see um, these small scale evaluations that hopefully as a whole will lead to something much bigger. So, of course, we'd all like, well, we, my, you may have got this, but my team do like a systematic review. Um, all, all of our PhD students do systematic reviews, um, and we'd love to do RCTs for everything, but the reality is, you know, they may be top of the Maryland scale, but we just can't do that because of money and resources. Um, so what we did a few years ago, just as an example is, and I talked about this in my first slide, was we were asked by Public Health England to do a rapid review of what we know about alcohol use disorders and brief interventions in the criminal justice system in relation to the UK. Now, this surprised me because firstly, I thought, surely you know about this if, you're, if we're advocating brief interventions. 
but they didn't. But what we learned from that was we did the paper and it was used. It was one of those rare occurrences where we write a, we write a journal article and it was used. And it was used because of this. They asked us to produce fact sheets on the different sectors sections of the, um, of the work that we'd done. So we produced four fact sheets relating to the prison, probation, custody suite, um, and young people. They had to be one page, and, and I fought to the death and managed to get the references put on the back of the page. Um, but these have been downloaded any number of times, and it means practitioners have this information to hand very quickly, and we know this is being used. So this made us think we need to think about different ways that we do our work. We can't be at the top of that ivory tower where... Um, where Dumbledore sits while he's, um, while he's writing all of his papers. We're very much a team at Teesside where we are working with practitioners to work on projects that can make a difference to the population at large, and that's really important to us. So we came down the tower. I don't think we were ever up it, but we came down the tower and we started working within, um, with, with people. So... Why won't they do this? Even if they had the money, would they do this? Well, I've just finished um, a randomised control trial of brief interventions in the school setting. It took seven years from start to finish to do that. Now, with public health funding, they can't wait seven years to find out if something works. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we, we don't have as much evidence-based practice as we would like to have. So Natalie's going to come up now and talk you through what we mean by co-production, and she's going to give you an example of a co-production project she's working on, and then I'm going to come in and just finish off, because I know you want to get ready for the party. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for that uh, introduction, Dot. Um, so, like Dot said, I'm Natalie Connor. I work for uh, Teesside University, and I split my time between Durham County Council within the public health team, and I also spend a couple of days of work working with Tees Valley Sport. Now, we moved over to uh, social sciences and law uh, a few months ago, and I was thinking, why am I moving over uh, to sit within the criminology department and public health? But actually, as the evaluations have unfolded, I've seen that link between public health and the criminal justice setting. Uh, so, for example, one of the evaluations that I've been working on with Durham County Council uh, has linked in with an intervention that's been delivered by the local authority and the police um, on a support system for children in schools following on from a domestic abuse incident. Uh, and currently I'm in talks with uh, probation services uh, in Cleveland, uh, since Stockton, uh, to look at interventions to um, reduce reoffending using sport and physical activity. So that crossover is there. But like Dot said, I'm here to talk about co-production and the importance of that. Um, and it's really about, you know, what do we mean by co-production? It's about bringing academics and practitioners together to work on something. In this case, for me, it's been evaluations. Uh, really, really important because the academics can bring across their expertise, maybe with theories. It could be looking at robust methods of evaluation. And the practitioners themselves, they bring a different type of experience and skill set. They bring that knowledge of local community need, and they also have wonderful access to participants because they're working with those communities on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's something Dot, Dot talked about, the ivory tower. Uh, with co-production, it's not just about parachuting in these experts, it's actually about working together. We've just got a little slide here around kind of that theory behind co-production. I won't go into too much detail about it. Um, really, in the 70s, social policy started to recognise how service users were really important in designing services and how that would make a difference. We've got a number of uh, theoretical approaches up on the, on the screen there. We've got four. What I would say is that with co-production, uh, the difference tends to be around okay, who's actually going to be governing this piece of research? 
who's making the most commitment? Is it 40, 60? Uh, who's responsible for the results? Where's the accountability lie? So that tends to, to, have a, uh, to help inform which theoretical approach to use. Certainly with my role at Durham County Council, uh, I'm employed by Teesside University, but I'm embedded within Durham County Council for a day a week. Uh, I think so far I've worked on six evaluations. Dot said we've done 15 in total, but that's with other colleagues. I've worked on six. And certainly the level of involvement from practitioners does vary. You know, people have different job roles, different time constraints. And so that's been something that varies throughout, but that's something that's got to be negotiated at the beginning of an evaluation. I think the, the slide that we've got up here really is trying to, to show the importance of how co-production helps to bring everybody around the table. So you're providing a seat for everybody around the table to bring their skill set. Um, you're trying to basically design and develop pieces of a jigsaw that hopefully will fit together because you want that jigsaw to solve a problem, uh, in essence. Like I said, the six evaluations I've worked on so far, they've been different in terms of the commitment that um, practitioners have been able to give, and that's not a negative, that's just reality. Uh, but what I've found recently with an intervention looking at um, fuel poverty, I had a colleague uh, from the local authority who I worked on with some focus groups, and he actually got really heavily involved with the data collection. Uh, and I, I remember just sat doing a focus group with some uh, vulnerable people, and the, the colleague started to ask some really important questions, and I thought, you know what, I would never uh, in a million years have thought of that question, and so therefore, if it was just me here, we would have missed that important piece of data. So that's the kind of value that co-production research brings. I just thought that was, that was really important to, to mention. So again, we're talking about the, the links between public health and the criminal justice setting. Um, Operation Encompass is a service that's being rolled out across uh, Durham at the moment. Uh, it started in 2017 and we were asked to evaluate it. Uh, Operation Encompass is delivered by the local authority and by the police, and it's an intervention that has been put in place to support young people if they've, be, if they've been witness to a domestic violence incident, and that support actually comes into place the day after. So there'll be lots of things that go on behind the scene in terms of support systems in place, but this is immediate support within the school setting the day after a domestic violence incident. And we were asked to do uh, an implementation evaluation uh, and to look at the, the processes around this as a service. You know, it was brand new. Um, you know, what would the, the numbers be like coming through the system in terms of notifications, uh, in terms of the, the police, you know, having to write up the reports to go into the system, the, the system where the notifications go into. And the core production element of this was that the evaluation was designed by many people around the table. So you had Teesside University there, but you also had the police. Police were involved with the, developing the evaluation. Um, you had representatives representatives from schools, you had the local authority there with public health, and so everybody was sat around the table, uh, not only to design the intervention itself, but the evaluation, uh, and, and that was crucial. What we've um, kind of, we've had three roadshows last week actually, uh, going around to speak to about 150 uh, members of, of the school establishment, so the schools who have been involved with Operation Encompass, to talk about the evaluation findings. And that's been actually quite refreshing. So we, we've went along and we've been able to tag team these roadshows from a public health perspective, but also an evaluation perspective. So just to, to give a little bit more information about the intervention itself, if there was a domestic violence incident in a home and the police have gone and done a report, the, the report would need to hit three criteria to then be triggered to be a notification into schools the next day. So if there was a child present in the house between the ages of four and 16, and if that risk in the house was deemed to be medium or high, uh, and the, the child was actually present, and when we say present, we don't even just mean to, to witness, but if they were upstairs um, in their bedroom that would trigger a point to go through the notification system, and then we were looking to see whether or not the schools would receive that notification before 9 a.m. the next day. They receive that notification, it means then that the 
school staff can give some support to pupils that might come in, they might be tired if they've been taken out of their bed in the middle of the night, they might not have done the homework, um, they might not have had their breakfast. And so this support system is about that, that immediate impact that school staff can have uh, within those following hours to not add on to that, that burden and that trouble that that young person might be facing. It was mixed methods. In case we did a lot of qualitative work, but we looked at the process um, system. And like I said, we've already started to go through and talk through what the evaluation has found. I don't have time to go through that today. But the fantastic thing about the co-production is that in these uh, roadshows, I've been able to go up and present the findings. And then we've had the staff from the local authority have been able to say, and you know what? This is what we're doing now. This is the changes that we've made because of this finding. And although there's plenty of things that need to be improved upon and tweaked and changed, you can feel that there's an appreciation from all those in, involved within the system that, okay, yeah, things aren't perfect, but we, everybody has had a seat around the table to help design this as an intervention, um, and there's still that room for, for feedback and dialogue between those who are delivering the intervention and those who are receiving it and experiencing it. So there's just a, it's, it's, it's a benefit of co-production and a real appreciation there. Um, and that's why I've came along to kind of seeing why co-production is a fantastic way to do research. And thank you, Dot, for in, inviting me along today to talk about that. So back over to Dot. No, it should be on there. Oh. I've hidden it, but I think with my notes. Because it would be about three pages long. And Risk It CGS is a randomised controlled trial. It's across um, three geographical areas in the UK, and it's looking at a group based, whether a group based intervention with young people involved in the criminal justice system who have substance misuse issues um, reduce their substance use um, six and 12 months post intervention. And the important thing about this is, because as a professor, I don't get out to do much data collecting, but for one reason or another, we were short staffed when we were data collecting for this. So I did, um, I collected quite a lot of data for this, which is great. And I recommend that all of us who get to professorial lecture should go, uh, um, we should all go out and do some data collection to keep our feet firmly on the ground. Because it's when you go out and you data collect that you get to talk to the staff and you get to talk to the young people. And they tell you what they like and don't like about something. So. This was, um, we had to ask a load of questions, and you know what it's like when you're asked to ask, when you're asked to fill in a load of questions. So we, we talked to young people beforehand, and what we did was we put all of these questions onto an iPad. And this iPad um, was really useful because not only was it quicker, quicker as well for data entry, we didn't have to do any data entry, but it was also easier to use for those young people who had some literacy issues because it was more visual than, um, than a paper version. But a lot of them just asked us to fill it in with them. Um, so for us, right from um, day one, we talked to young people and we talked to practitioners about what should be involved in this intervention and how it should be done and how follow-up should be done. The difference now to when we did the restorative justice trials in, gosh, 2000, is that everybody has mobile phones now. We didn't have mobile phones back then. So you'd ring a house number and somebody might answer. Now, because people see the number come up, you know, it's harder to get them to answer the phones. So what we do is we talk to the young people about that and we say, you know, we'll send you a text beforehand and we come up with ideas with them um, to do the follow-up. So we've had a lot of, um, lot of help from the young people and from, um, from the practitioners. I would argue we should not be doing any kind of research study without the involvement of co-production. I feel that strongly about it. What I think is that if we work together and draw on each other's knowledge and experience, it's possible to live to deliver services which are more translational into real-world practice. 
my team and myself don't want to be doing research that's going to go on a shelf. We're here to make population change, whether that population is a small population or a big population. There's lots of challenges within this, and we have learned by experience. I, I didn't even realise when I started doing this work that actually we've been doing co-production on the restorative justice trials all those years ago, but we didn't use the term then. Um, so there's many challenges when it does happen and it happens well, even if the research comes out quite badly and doesn't give the results people want, it's particularly illuminating because, as Natalie said, everyone feels like they've had a say in that. They've had a say in the questions we're going to ask, how we're going to ask them, where we're going to ask them, so they can't come back a year later and say, well, you didn't ask this. We came up with the ideas together. And this picture here is something I'm very proud of, and, and um, Nat and Jen are involved in this. It's a book that's coming out in September about co-creating and co-producing research evidence. And what we did was we've used um, a number of case studies within this to show how you can do uh, co-production. And what does it actually mean with top tips um, on the things that you need to think about? I mean, I can tell you now, just, you, you know, still please buy it. Um, you know, role definition at the very beginning and keep checking on that becomes very important. I'm sure Natalie would agree with me on that. So what are we saying we're going to do? I, one thing that really annoys practitioners is if we say we're going to do something and we don't do it, or we don't do it when we say we, we're going to do it, you have to keep the promises. Their time frames are very different to ours, and please explain to them the ethical approval process so they're aware of it beforehand. So that's the end of our talks. Um, I'm aware we've got a few minutes left here, so I'm going to, I, I mean, I know, I know you want to get ready for the party, but I'm hoping you've all got at least one question each for us. So can I ask um, my colleagues to come up here? Because um, it feels like we're on question time. And I should say that we've got colleagues at home watching this video, live stream, hello, um, which I think is a really good idea, I have to say, so that we can share this with colleagues and students back home and family, of course. So um, please ask us some really interesting questions, no pressure. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Rob. I just want to say, when you were talking about trauma, yes. are you looking at trauma at any age or in particular childhood trauma? I have a def I, my definition is just general trauma. Um, the reason I've gone with that is because um, certainly in the secure um, hospital setting, um, people have experienced trauma sometimes as early childhood, but also sometimes it's as a result of PTSD or a result of, sort of any other significant event that's happened in life, often related to um, perhaps abuse or physical or sexual abuse as well. So the, the definition is broad, particularly for that reason. And again, I think linked to what Jennifer was saying and, you know, the, the struggles of, of gaining access to, to do research in prison settings. Yeah. And I guess a lot of the, you know, you talk about complex needs and quite often, as you know, you highlighted like offending behaviour, involvement in criminal justice system, you know, is one of those kind of complex needs as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, what do you think you would, you'll, you'll gain from focusing on a kind of mental health setting? rather than a, a prison system where you, can, you know, quite often, you know, maybe there's the same kind of cohort of people. Sometimes they are the same, but not always. And I think what I didn't want to do was to exclude a group of people. But also I think it's more relating to um, the fact that there's such a lack of evidence around, around that particular area and that group of people. Um, I, I've been really fortunate. I've not had the, the sort of level of difficulties getting into that setting. Um, I've had... Um, very early days, I, I sort of, in a co-produced way, went to talk to the, the group of people. Um, I've made those alignments with them. I've been into the hospital often, got to know the teams, that sort of stuff. So um, before I even went for my ethical approval, so that's helped. And I think also because of my being a pragmatic, you know, practitioner, then that's helped as well. Because people, there's an element of a level of trust there already in terms of I probably know what I'm talking about. 
I think what's really interesting, Rob, is that she's that Lynn has been given an honorary contract to work there. And I think it's because she has got a practitioner background that that's been the way to go. But Jen will get into the prison. <laughs> <laughs> A quick one. When is the book coming out? Because it sounds September. <laughs> September. It's been. I have to say, it's been. It's been a, a work of love. It really has. It's something that we've talked about with the Durham County Council, where it came out, where we came up with this idea about four or five years ago, and then we seriously thought about it. And of course, you know, the publishers give you a certain amount of time, and then you're like a lunatic the last few weeks trying to get it finished. So it's now being typeset as we speak. But it was very easy to write, which is really surprising because we've got the academic perspective, obviously, but we've got practitioner's perspective, and we've got a number of different studies within that. So Jen's done one about working in prisons. I've done a couple, one about working in a high school setting, and one about working with the police. And Natalie's done one on a mental health project um, that she worked on. It's actually suicide ideation uh, within Durham County Council. So it's very easy to write, so September. <laughs> I'm it's sure it'll answer. be the top of the New York bestsellers <laughs> list. A signed copy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the co-production uh, terminology and the the method in itself. Is it quite new in Britain, or when when has the co-production started to be used? I think it's been around for a long time. Um, but I don't think we called it co-production and other people call it different things. So embedded researcher. So when you go in and you work with people. So on the restorative justice trials, I was, um, I worked within the police station, but we didn't really think about this. Um, we didn't think about it as a term. So the, the theoretical concepts that, um, that Natalie was talking about um, have come out around about the 90s, 2000s, but it's quite a new phenomenon and we're still trying to get our head around it. When we started this, it all started because somebody came to me and said, that it wasn't even who we're working with now, but somebody had come and said, we're paying out small amounts of money for small evaluations and they're done and people go. So they come in very quickly, do it and go out and they don't get to know the system. So the idea came up that rather than pay for small pieces of, um, of research, why don't we pay for a year and do three evaluations over the year, but, but embed a researcher within the public health team? Um, and we're still there five years later, still doing these, these pieces of research. So they would, I'm sure they would say they've saved money on it, definitely. Um, so it, it, it's quite a new concept, but it's something that a lot of us were doing before. So patient and public involvement has been massive um, in health research and in, in, in criminal justice research. So it's, I mean, it just makes sense. You can't get a funding bid through in the UK anyway without a huge section on how you're gonna work with the public. And this is, this is an easy win of how to do that. And it's not about doing it for that reason. We do it because it makes for better research. I think, can I just say, as a, as a practitioner as well, um, I did a master's in uh, 2006 and I wrote about inclusion and working co-productively with people. Um, but it wasn't a sexy topic at that time and it didn't have a name. <laughs> so it has been around yeah. for a long time. It's just, um, I think now the theoretical base is catching up with the practical base. It's more structured. Is it based on longevity uh, that you do the co-production uh, on a longer period of time? You can, but you don't have to. So you could do the work we're doing with a school started off by me just going in and doing some, some chats with students um, and we ended up saying, well, why don't you do a piece of research? And they designed and did that research. It was only supposed to be over about a year and I'm still there three years later onto my second group. So it could be something quite small and it could be that we just sat down with practitioners and relevant people round a table, came up with an idea and they let us go off and do the research. That's not the stuff we like to do, but that is co-production. And then they have a look at the end. But what, 
what we do is, I think the reason it's been so successful in Durham is the longevity of it. I mean, it really has been and Probably because of that. to begin with, it was maybe an idea that, okay, this will be a short term yeah. project yeah. and then all of our practitioners know will be upskilled and they'll know exactly what to do and they'll be able to go out and do the, this research. But actually they've, they've seen the value in having people with that expertise and knowledge come in and add value to their teams that are working with their heavy workloads. And so, yeah, it might not be these huge multi-million pound trials, but it's still kind of ongoing and it has become kind of sustainable. It's become normalised, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah. Mm. And similarly, there's a colleague from Teesside University, Mandy Cheatham, and, and she works with Gateshead Council and, does, and, the same and thing. does exactly the same. And she's embedded within the local authority there. And that's been a contract that's been you know, continuously extended. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I found the term fascinating because I, I myself, I do my studies in Finland and in Finland the academics is split so that we have universities and then we have universities of applied sciences and the universities of applied sciences, they focus their entire practice on a very, sim very similar parallel things mm. that co-production is. So I found it the term very fascinating and I'm glad that this kind of attitudes, if you will, or the, this kind of practice is on the rise elsewhere as well, because it does keep a very close uh, attachment to the fields that it are does. being studied. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mm -hmm. need a copy of our book in September. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is George Brown. I'm from uh, Kansas State University in the U.S. and also I'm a senior research analyst with the Kansas Sentencing Commission. I think it was actually you had mentioned something during my session about how a lot of times criminal justice practitioners and community health um, providers have their idea on what success is a, is a little bit different. Um, could you guys elaborate kind of with each of the subjects you guys have spoke about today on how that is? Because I've tried to pinpoint, you know, I'm like I said, I'm a criminologist, but also a practitioner. Yeah. They're really trying to understand um, what that really means in your guys' area of, of research. And also, do you see a difference in like criminological literature versus being a practitioner? Are there different scenarios through your meta-analysis analysis on what's been said about your subject of interest? Well, the answer is yes. And criminological research, I would say we're experimental criminologists. That's what our work is. Um, and I know that term is quite relatively new. Um, and we still have to explain it um, to a lot of people. I think for me, a, a good example of that is work that when, when you do work around alcohol. So if I find an intervention works relatively cheap um, in the prison setting. Um, first of all, the funding, most of the funding I get comes through public health, which now encompasses criminal justice, so it's great for me. Um, but it means that um, if uh, you have to have a health outcome, you have to have a health outcome. So usually it's um, reduction in use. So using a tool like the audit, like I said. So if I give a talk here to 500 criminal, you know, people who work in the criminal justice system and I say, I found this intervention, it's gonna cost you 20 pounds each, it's gonna be great, um, to deliver this and it's gonna have a huge effect. They're gonna say, who's gonna pay for it? So the thing about an alcohol or a drug intervention is, at the minute, it comes through public health now, but it always came through the health, the health um, arena. But if it is reducing reoffending, is it a criminal justice charge? And that's where I think for us it gets much better because of the public health brings in criminal justice and, and health. But we still have huge problems about this. There's, there's a huge problem around well, if we open that, is it going to be a can of worms that needs more um, input into it? And who pays for that, criminal justice or, um, or health? So I think, there's, there, I think there is more work to do around what we report as academics. I don't know if you've read the paper that Larry wrote. I was fifth author on it, called 12 Experiments in Restorative Justice. It's a really good, I send it to all my students because it's a really good paper, not only because my name's on it, but that, it, it's actually irrelevant to that. It explains the <coughs> process of how to do research in the criminal justice system. 
and the difficulties of that. And I think it's a really good paper to read. So for me, it's a struggle I have all the time. I'm a, I'm a, well, Larry made me a criminologist, but I'm a public health researcher. I've just moved from School of Health to the School of Social Sciences in the criminology department, which I was thrilled about, because when I was in health, they said, you're a criminologist. Now I'm in criminology, they say, you're a health researcher. So that whole idea about experimental criminology and bringing public health, you know, knife crime is now being seen as a public health issue in England. I think the next real focus we're gonna see in criminological research in this area is that link between public health and criminal justice in order to move things forward. I think as well, again, as a practitioner previously, um, I was responsible for uh, a sort of bringing drug treatment into the UK prisons. I was one of the interventionists that had to go in and sort of deliver that. Um, and how for the outcomes for that really were around making it feel from a criminal justice perspective that was an impact but also from a health yeah. perspective, there was a reduction. And it's about getting that common goal together, really. And, and certainly I've seen over the years, certainly over more recent years, that commonality and goals together really help to influence that. So if you've got something that you can jointly work on, that's where you get the biggest impact. And it, ultimately, it's the impact for the individuals that we're delivering things to. And there is that, it's trying to get that from the outset with the practitioners that you're working with because a, a practitioner might say, well, we want to do this evaluation because we want to see if this service is efficient, you know, is it, is it saving money? How much is it costing? Can we roll this out um, to a universally? Um, whereas as the researcher, you're not as, you, you're concerned more about maybe the implementation and the worst thing that you can do as a, a researcher is then have to go away and say, actually, this service isn't efficient and you're not getting your value for money. So that's where I'm sure you'll have found yourself as a practitioner, that it can be sometimes a difficult scenario. And we talk about that in the book as well, about the difficulties um, with co-production research. But like Lynn said, it's about finding that common ground right at the beginning. We have had to do that um, with the work that we've done in Durham. And, and, and it's not a nice conversation to have, but where there are social scientists, you know, when we were doing the restorative justice trials, I wasn't there to say restorative justice works or doesn't work, I was there to test it. But it is a difficult, we're getting better at it, yeah. and we usually, you know, make sure that the, the top people know before we go in a room, most people know. Um, but that's why we're there, we're not there to make everybody happy and just make it all look flowery, that's not our job as social scientists. Anything else? Well, I think it's time we all got ready for the party. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.